Nigerian Medical Association supports strike by resident doctors and gives the federal government 21 days to resolve issues. The Secretary General of the NMA will be talking to us this morning. And confusion over electricity tariff as a coal distribution company retracts circular notifying consumers of an increase. We'll take a look at the tariffs, grid collapse and the power supply. Plus a look at the papers this morning and of course a review of some of the major stories making headlines across Nigeria today. You don't want to miss it. With that, we say good morning and welcome to another week and a Monday morning here on The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. I am Osao Gi Ogboma. We hope that we have a very interesting week ahead of us. Good morning once again. We always will start with the top trending stories and share with you some of the biggest stories across uh, Nigeria from the weekend and uh, till this morning. And I'll start with a really sad one, and that is the death, the reported killing of a uh, son of a seven senator. He's the Senate Majority Leader, Bala Ibn Naala. Uh, his son, Captain uh, Ibn Naala, was uh, killed over the weekend in Kaduna State. There's a um, a lot of controversy concerning this, you know, because first of all, it's coming just a few days after the attack on the Nigerian Defense Academy. Um, and so there have been lots of worries from Northern Nigeria and from Kaduna State. We hope that we'll be able to speak with uh, um, someone out of one who is the Commissioner for Security and uh, Home Affairs. Uh, sometime during the week to share his thoughts on what exactly the situation is. But it's another very, very sad incident, not just because of the uh, personality and, uh, you know, the fact that he's the son of a senator, but, you know, the fact that it, it, it seems to be getting worse. Um, from reports, he was killed in his home by bandits. Um, last week, I had, uh, you know, a quick thought on what exactly we need to do and what Nigerian and the Nigerian government needs to do to share some clarity on exactly what we are dealing with. Um, who are the bandits and you know, how did they emerge? What exactly you know, are they fighting for? Um, are these just mere criminals? Because you know, when you hear of killings um, across Nigeria and you don't hear that anything has been stolen or anybody has been robbed, it, it feels weird calling them just bandits. So are these the same people with the Boko Haram sect? Are these an entirely you know, different uh, you know, group of armed you know, uh, criminals or militia? Who exactly are they? It's pretty much the same thing when we talk about unknown gunmen. How you know, is it that for more than a year now we've been hearing about unknown gunmen and we still have no idea who unknown gunmen are. They have not, the Nigerian government has not been able to unmask any of these elements. And pretty much the same thing with just, you know, given a group of criminals, the name bandits, who exactly are they? I've, I've also seen a couple of comments on the social media platforms saying very, very, very sad comments, you know, but basically saying, well, you know, now that it's getting close to home, the Nigerian government may act, which I don't agree with. I believe that every single Nigerian life uh, should be valued and should be protected and not, no death should be, should be spoken about in, in a way like that. So it's a really, really sad story. Um, and we hope that there is some clarity. We hope that these people will be apprehended, as, of course, the Nigerian government and the state security services would always promise that whoever it is that carried out these atrocities will be apprehended and will be made to face the full wrath of the law. We've heard that so many, many, many times. But we still don't see, as Nigerians don't see, a lot of these things actually happening. Um, and that is these bandits or these criminals, these, these militants uh, facing the full wrath of the law. Pretty much the same thing was said when the Nigerian Defense Academy was um, attacked and we lost uh, three Nigerian um, uh, um, you know, army officers. The government said pretty much the same thing, that these people will be apprehended and will be made to face the, the law. Um, but it's days after. There's still no news about these people being apprehended. We still do not know exactly what Nigeria's security situation is and what must be done. Um, where is the honesty? And it's one thing that I've mentioned a couple of times. Where's the honesty with dealing with these issues? And if we cannot have some level of honesty with why these things are difficult to address, why it is difficult to find the people who are sponsoring these bandits, why it's difficult to, you know, close our borders, you know, and ensure that there's less weapons proliferation across Nigeria, because these are some of the answers. 
How do weapons get to these people? Those weapons aren't locally made. They're not made here in Nigeria. How do they get to the hands of these, uh, you know, these criminals? Um, who are the people sponsoring these, you know, these criminals? How have we gone almost a decade, more than a decade actually, and Nigeria still is not able to point out 10, 5, 2, 1 person who has been arrested for financially supporting these terrorists and these bandits makes you know very very little sense but once again rest in peace to captain uh, bin naala and uh, we hope that the family uh, will be able to get over this uh, period also um, let's move to kano state where the kano hisba has gotten you know some criticism for putting out a statement over the weekend as to why they treat uh, the rich and the poor different um, the representative uh, was speaking over the weekend and gave reasons for, uh, the, you know, well, gave reasons why the Kano Hizba doesn't, you know, carry out the same treatment that they give to the poor on the rich. And this is coming off um, a couple of events that have taken place in the last few weeks where some of the things that the Kano Hizba has openly spoken about and has criticized others for and has sent people to uh, Sharia court for have been ignored, but it's the same reason you know, that these people carry out, you know, cut people's hair, in, you know, in, in public, um, you know, ban the sale of alcohol, destroy some business places, and give some really, really shocking uh, laws that must be followed by people in Kano State and in, in parts of the country that there is the Sharia law. Um, the Kano Hizba said that they treat the rich and the poor different because it is part of uh, Sharia and Islam not to criticize leaders. Well, that might make sense to him and to the Kano Hizba for putting out a statement like that because they had to say something. Um, but some of all these things still don't make a lot of sense to Nigerians and it still sounds very hypocritical. Um, one of the challenges that I have with that is that um, it, it means that the interpretation or their interpretation of Islam and the Sharia law doesn't include holding leaders accountable. For very, very many years now, people have pointed out the fact that you know, the, the northern part of Nigeria seems to have the worst with regards to infrastructural development, education, healthcare. You know, you know the, the benefits of, you know, being in a, in a democracy and having a government, they seem to have the worst of it. But there still isn't a loud voice from that part of the country demanding better governance. There's still, I mean, look at the amount of IDPs, look at the amount of, of, of our Marjorie kids, out-of-school children. It's, it's the largest number across the country. They've also suffered the, the worst with regards to insecurity. But there still isn't a large voice from that part of the country asking for better governance, asking for better government, asking for more responsibility from their government at every level, from the local, local to the state to the federal. There still isn't. And when it's time to vote, you still see a large number of these people tripping out to vote simply based on religion. And from what the Kano Hizba has said, it means that there will not be any criticism for government simply because that's what their interpretation of Sharia or Islam, you know, tells. So when you are, you know, a, a part of that, you know, um, area in Nigeria, you should not criticize government, neither should you be able to criticize your leaders because what they're saying is, oh, we, you know, Islam tells us to not criticize our leaders and that's the reason we would rather, you know, cut off the hair of a poor man in the streets than do the same thing to a rich man's child because not every single person is a leader. Not every rich, influential person in the North is a leader. It might just be rich businessmen. And you see them and their kids being able to dress freely in Northern Nigeria, but the less influential poor cannot you know, have the same privileges. And so that's really what it means. And also the fact that religion is a tool of control in many, many parts of the world. And the reason I say this is the people from Northern Nigeria, when they read a statement like this, will not be able to spot the hypocrisy with that statement because they would simply understand that, well, that's what their, well, that, you know, the interpretation of uh, Islam and Sharia law teaches. And so they would basically just fall in line with that statement instead of pointing out the hypocrisy with the actions of the Kano Hizba. Um, and so it gives them less, you know, less of a voice to, to point out that hypocrisy and they will simply fall in line because once it has been coated or sugar coated with religious uh, uh, coverings, then there's really no voice that can be heard. Well, that's it, you know, with regards to his band, their statements. We also would point, uh, you know, and celebrate this morning, Bose Ola Omolayo. I almost forgot her name. And congratulations to her. She's one of Nigeria's Paralympic athletes who has just won gold at the Tokyo Paralympic Games uh, by lifting 141 kilograms um, uh, um, weight. Um, she came first 
Uh, next, of course, was a, a, a Paralympic athlete from Ukraine, Natalia Olink from Ukraine, who lifted 133. And uh, bronze was by Vera Morofava, a Russian Federation athlete with 132, uh, 132 kilograms um, uh, lifting. So congratulations to Bosse. She is, of course, uh, one of the people who has made Nigeria proud over the weekend. Last week, we spoke about supporting the Paralympians as much as we possibly can. They should be given as much support financially and media-wise. They should be spoken about. They should be celebrated. They should be brought back home as heroes. And we shouldn't always remember them only when it's time for the Paralympic Games. These are people who have done Nigeria exceptionally well. And one thing that I said is, what, what is the thing about the Paralympians? What is the, the reason they have continued? Continue to break these boundaries and win these medals that is different from the other athletes. Is it the training is different? Are they getting better support, you know, with equipment and with training? Or do they just have a totally different space um, compared to other athletes, Nigerian athletes um, at the Olympics and any, any other um, uh, games? Um, that's something that you know, I hope that we would understand. But most importantly, we must celebrate people like her. We must celebrate every other Paralympian who has done Nigeria proud, won you know, uh, gold, uh, silver, or bronze. And they should be you know, brought back to Nigeria and given a red carpet treatment because that's exactly what we should do. Finally, also in sports, uh, we're going to move to talking about Arsenal and Manchester City. Over the weekend, um, it was a complete whitewashing of the Arsenal Football Club. Uh, Manchester City won that game five goals to nil. But that's not what our top trending is. I hope that we can quickly play a short clip for you where the Arsenal fans uh, sang a song, you know, or were, you know, given a chant at the stadium saying, you're nothing special, we lose every weekend. Hilarious. And one thing I think everyone should do, go on YouTube, all right? Look out for fan uh, chants in stadiums. You see some of the most hilarious uh, lines that they chant. Some of, the most, some of them, you know, might be a little racist every now and then, but um, the most hilarious chants in stadium is what you get to see um, in the EPL. All right, so let, let's quickly share that clip with you and I'll come back to talk about it. Even if I enjoy laughing at Arsenal, this is on a totally different level of hilarious. You know, and it, you know, it really just tells the mood of Arsenal fans who have completely given up on the club. You know, don't care about Mikel Arteta or any of his, you know, his policies. Um, you know, I saw a lot of people complain over the weekend about how he needs to be sacked. There's no way that he can win anything or he can go you know, far this um, season with the team that he has or with that coach. Um, and it makes you kind of feel bad for Arsenal. But... I would find any reason to laugh at Arsenal, and this is one very, very special reason. I've saved that video on my phone, and I'll play it all through the week. We lose every week. You're nothing special. We lose every week. <laughs> Welcome to The Breakfast once again. Stay with us. We'll take a short break. When we come back, Tunde Kolawale will be joining us uh, for Off the Press here on The Breakfast. Good morning.